Hello. Hi. Hi, how are you? Oh, I'm, I'm seem to be playing a game of whack-a-mole around here. Oh yeah. <laughs> Have you heard of the game whack-a-mole? You know what it is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I'm doing, playing whack-a-mole with my yard and my house. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> it was so funny. Right, well, it's like, mm. anyways, <laughs> it's called whack a mole. That's yeah, what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have to leave in a half an hour because I'm supposed to be in Winnipeg. So okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, welcome to the meeting. Hello, uh, Alan and Mary Krishna and Dick and Susan. <laughs> So, uh, Hare Krishna. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hi, how are you? Hello, computer wise. Oh, oh. The danger is. So, turn your mic off. Yeah, I'll yeah. turn myself. I'm going to turn myself off because I'm, I'm on a long screen. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think most big companies do have. Oh, there's still someone's audio. Or something playing. Unless you download the app, and then the this company moves. So Hare Krishna. A lot about you. Well, that's separate. So it's between. Okay, thank you. Uh, Hare Krishna. Uh, hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so how are you doing? Yeah. So I think I've uh, finished up with the application, but I'm having some problem to bring it to the website because. Yeah. There's some error I'm not able to figure it out by. I'll uh, figure it out within the next two or three days, I think. It's fine. Yeah, okay. rather than that, uh, the application is ready, I guess. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, you mean so you, you're you ready to submit your project, but you can't get to the... I just have to write the readme file for the uh, re repository. Okay. The instructions and all. That's it. Yeah. What, what about the website? What was the problem? Um, I'm getting some error uh, running the Python scripts uh, oh. with the website, so I'm trying to solve it. Oh, okay. So, do you have something like? Can you show us what you have now, or? Um, you... <laughs> actually, I logged in using my Linux, and I don't have anything in this. I mean, uh, all the work I did was in Windows. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'll. Uh, I'll sh maybe I can do a meeting. Um, Maybe tomorrow or any any other day you are free and show you the progress. Yeah, is it fine? Yeah, that's fine. We can do that. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, and then I I don't know where Karan is. I think he's all set. He's on track as well. But uh, I haven't seen anything. Maybe he can come tomorrow. Um, yeah. Yeah. So then uh, I'll ask him, and we can we three can do a meeting together. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So you're all set that you're on track to go for. Yeah. All right. Uh, Alon, hello. Thank you for uh, the uh, Yeah. Kind of like I can also give some updates. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So I've been uh, working on the tracking um, the Basil area uh, problem. And uh, I was doing some last week, I was trying uh, some algorithms to kind of like find some dots uh, to kind of track. Uh, it didn't work so well. I was using the algorithm of track uh, from OpenCV from Paris to kind of track some corners. But after that, I did use uh, the optical flow algorithm to track some uh, points in the Boston area and that worked really well. And then we can show the video that I was producing yesterday. Just a second. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna go. Go to the project. Um, 
Yeah, then I created, I also like uh, made a PR uh, and then I like merged, I think probably, I don't know, like maybe you merged it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. Okay. Ilan, I have, a, I have a suggestion. Look at the uh, papers by Edgar and Subanko. And mm -hmm. uh, if you can show that the noise in Vassilari is substantially less than the noise that was measured for those for, for those cells, then that might be good enough, rather than trying to get an absolute baseline of smooth motion. Yes. I, I, I was trying to get hold of the papers last week that uh, you mentioned, but uh, I didn't see them in the, the folder that you shared with me. Maybe. Oh, you did? Oh, well, yeah. they're on your diet, the diatom section. Is this subfolder diatom? Yes. I went to that folder. And yeah, but I find yes, uh, all right, maybe I'll give another look. Or... I'll, I'll check to make sure they're there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, uh, I'll share the screen. All right. This screen. Here we go. Yes. So, uh, this is a video uh, before that. There's a video that um, uh, Thomas. Uh, shared with me and it's really good because it's uh kind of the resolution is quite well it's a i think a thousand two hundred and eighty or seven hundred uh that's a hundred frame per second but that's kind of like maybe not doesn't matter i think maybe so much maybe it's kind of just contributes to the smoothness but it's also like with a, just like a single uh the, the camera doesn't move around so much so that's kind of good um, and over that, what I did, I took the optical flow from the website and what I did, it kind of find, it found some uh, points on the screen or uh, on the Basileria to kind of good to track. And then we, you can see that it ha it shows the kind of trajectory of the, of these points. Um, wow. And I just was kind of trying it and kind of like happily out of the box, it's just like produced like really good results. So, uh. That was really good um, to to have. Um, you see, there's like a, a bit of kind of like the the video is moving a bit, so you can see these kind of like on the tracks that it kind of moves, uh, which is a bit weird. But other than that, we can see like a really nice straight lines that kind of go um, behind each other on the kind of like lines of the pastel area, which is kind of really good. Yeah. Yeah, so yes. this is just a standard optical flow algorithm. Uh, yes, yes, okay. just from the, yeah, kind of like the optical flow, even like from the tutorial, kind of like uh, uh, for op OpenCV. Okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, just, yeah, this one and the code, yeah, it's just this one that I took and then just made it work on the, on the, kind of video itself. I also like added another component that kind of saves, kind of like everything. Uh, just kind of like uh, the printing on the on the images, and then yeah, just how that's how it produced yeah, the video. Okay, yeah, I mean that looks great. It's it's very clear. It's got that one cycle, and you can just trace it and see if it works. We yes. were using uh, well, I think uh, uh, if you go to the paper that we wrote on this, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, Thomas, he was using some bio, biomechanical analysis where, you know, he's marking the center of the cell and looking at the stretch and all this. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's one way to do it. And then we were yeah. using machine learning to segment the cells and uh, define the shape of them. And this, this looks like an intro, this looks like it would be a pretty good method. Uh, like it's pretty robust, I, I think. I mean, optical flow is used in a lot of different applications. So. Yes, and I think if I can, uh, if I can get some parameters to kind of like uh, make it work in other like videos of Basilaria, then that's kind of like that's helpful. Like for any other, like someone would want to use it further on. Or like... Okay, Arman, uh, I put the pathway in the chat to the uh, Subunco paper. Okay. Okay. Right, it's it's in there. It should be in the cloud. <laughs> All right, so let me, yeah, I can... The Edgar paper, uh, you could probably get yourself. I, it's not my paper, so I don't... This is from a file, just my paper. Ah, uh, yes. 
Okay, cool. Yeah. Nice. Well, because, thank uh, you. Yeah. If you have trouble getting it, let me know. Cool. And another thing, I think to further on, we had like some other like uh, chats, like Thomas and I, and he also was joining in, so that was helpful. And um, he's got yeah, Thomas. Very, yeah, they're going way over my head. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but Thomas did did try and like uh, yeah just like uh, make uh, describe the noise that's kind of happening uh, in his synthetic video, and we're gonna have a chat tomorrow, um, just like maybe sharing our results and decide like how kind of to go up next with it. So that's gonna make uh, gonna be good to uh, yeah. Question: Synthetic video means what? Yes, yeah, so I think what he did, he took like a, a one dat datum uh, image yeah. and then like uh, cropped it uh, and then just like pasted it in different places in the video. Um, oh, at, at even intervals. Yes, yes. Okay. To kind of like, okay. and if it's kind of like, yeah, it's in the same, goes, if he can produce it smoothly, he can see uh, the noise that's just happening from okay. the okay. tracking. And not from the movement. Yes, that, that can be tricky. I remember I bought one of the first Apple cameras, and uh, I tried exactly that to take pictures with it at even intervals. It was completely, oh. it was completely jittery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It didn't work. <laughs> yeah. So I did see some. They no longer support that camera. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a session tomorrow, and then uh, I don't know if Dick is gonna join us, but if if you can, then it's gonna be. Oh, with with uh, Ken Subanku, John, John, John. No, with with Thomas. Uh, with Thomas. With Thomas. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, what yes. time is that? Uh, I'm not sure. I I set it in the calendar, and then I shared an invite yeah. with you both. I think noon you, Central. Uh, yeah. Okay. I haven't seen it yet. Or I missed it. Yes. Okay. I'll look for it. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, that's kind of like that's it that I was let, working on. Let me uh, indicate one thing which would be fun to probably may or may not show up. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a hypothesis that the synchronization occurs at the moment that the two cells are aligned. Mm -hmm. And it occurs the, the by, yeah, if two cells are perfectly aligned, that is, you know, they're, yes. they're on top of each other. At that point, there might be a light piping effect. So uh -huh. the light goes from one to the other, and they can synchronize that way. Mm. Now, I don't know if that's detectable. <laughs> it would yeah, be, it would be a brief moment of synchronization. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Let me write it. Maybe I can try and like search for it on the videos. Of, uh, I just, I just tell you, nobody's ever tested the hypothesis. I uh -huh. <laughs> Maybe that's a place for optical coherence tomography. Maybe it would. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe the detector would detect the light. Maybe you need to. Yeah, Maybe, maybe. Uh, you know, for stationary diatoms, there's a possibility to change diatoms. If you have a col colonial chain, the light goes from one end to the other. In other words, the diatoms share the light, so to speak, that it gets on them. Yeah. Uh, no one's ever tested that yet. <laughs> uh, uh, to, to what extent do, does a diatom colony, any diatom colony, uh, act as a light pipe? We don't know. <laughs> Something else biological to torture Dr. Sharif with. <laughs> that would um, be, might be interesting. When you say light pipe, what does that mean? Oh, light pipe? Uh, oh, it's just a, uh, a light pipe. The simplest light pipe is simply a long, narrow piece of plastic or glass. And if you put light in one end, it comes out the other. Oh, okay. A fiber and, optic cable is a more common. Yeah, yeah, optic cable. So all your optic cables work this way. It's based on the principle of total internal reflection. 
Yeah. Okay, and uh, if you have a clean enough glass, you can have kilometers of the stuff. And it works. Yeah. Okay, that's that's where you like the cables come from. Yeah. Okay, so the question is whether diatom colonies take advantage of this or not. We don't know. <laughs> okay, so maybe you should throw throw that out as another project and give a lot of lifetime work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. For the yeah, long question. No, it's kind of like it's a it's a. I heard like it's a question like for a long time about like how diatom is kind of communicating. Well, see, at least for a colony that doesn't move, it would be easy, relatively easy, to put the colony down, put a light pipe next to one end of it, and see if light comes out the other end. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll turn you into an experimentalist yet. <laughs> uh, I just I just gone to the papers. Let me just like, share my screen again, just okay. because I wanted to find this paper that they. Uh, Talked about, and I couldn't find like a, a Subanko one if I'm kind of searching. Uh, um, go, go down to S, they're, they're alphabetized. Yes, so it's G and then keep going. Ah, uh, yes, get a good two. Yeah, <laughs> yes, my problem. Yes, I was kind of like, uh, all right, yeah, it should be there. Yes. Okay, you went too far. You went too far. I went too far. S A B. Yeah, there they are. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Sorry, I was kind of like, uh, my, my, I was kind of like searching for it like last week, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. Sometimes yeah. it's so. <laughs> and the annoying thing that uh, you can't like search within the sync kind of like platform, so kind of like, well, yeah. Just... Okay. All right. Um, another thing, I did do some more. I did look at the digital basileria, okay. and there are some issues open there from Diva Warm. I don't know who opened them because I don't see any explanation of kind of like what to do exactly there. Okay. Uh, so I don't know if there's a maintainer. Can you show us uh, what you mean? Yes. Yeah. So if it go, um, it's going to have been written years ago. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> my memory is a little bit rough. So in the digital basilaria, um, and then there's the issues, and there are some issues that are open, but I think that there's no, yeah, there's not much like explanation to them. Oh, this is an old issue. Yeah, this is something that we were going to do, and I don't think ever got done. Uh, yes. Some of these things were like, are like things that people wanted to do but haven't done. Like we were talking about doing a pix to pix uh, model for segmentation. Uh, there were some other things in here. So these are just kind of open. Uh, they're kind of not related to, and some of them are like just generally addressable. Some are not. Most of these are mm -hmm. not though. These are just tied okay. into different things. So. But um, yeah, this isn't this isn't run exactly like the evil learn repository. <laughs> okay, so I, I did have like some more look about the issues in devil learn, and I'm fixing uh, one thing there, okay, uh, yeah. but still uh, haven't finished with that. So maybe when I will then kind of create another uh, PR for it. Okay, yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Um, that would, yeah, thanks for uh, the pull request for. Uh, digital basilaria that you sent. I accepted it, so it should be in. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. so let me All share right. my screen. Yeah, it's, That's great. So this is actually our Diva Worm uh, uh, GitHub, which is different than the Diva Learn GitHub. This is an older uh, repository. has a lot of things, um, especially from like past years. This is digital basilaria. This is uh, the repository where we've done a lot of the stuff with Basilaria. We've had a lot of people contribute things, uh, especially in, in the past several years. We've done a lot of image uh, segmentation and other types of uh, things. Uh, then uh, Alan issued a pull request yesterday, which was this one here, 59. And so we added in all of the stuff that he was working on for 
I guess this was for the um, optical flow, is it? Yes, the optical okay. flow and also the Harris kind of corner detection, both okay. algorithms kind of like they are there. And maybe some more like, uh, yeah, just like yeah. stuff that's kind of get like ignoring stuff. Or, yeah. All right. So this is something someone could download and run or is this something you're just putting up publicly and... Um, yes, I think I'll, I'll check if uh, someone if he wants to download and run it because I don't know if I shared like the requirements uh, and an explanation to what to do. There is a dev log, a development log kind of like there okay, yeah. um, in the files. Um, uh, so that's also like with images and kind of like maybe some my notes of kind of like what kind of like my research kind of going on. Uh, you can see that in the yeah the last files there like at the bottom uh, dev log uh, at the left yeah uh, yes okay, so you, are the, is that movie that you're using from Thomas uh, what's that yeah the movie the movie that you showed is it from Thomas yes it is yes it is. okay that explains yes. why it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> yes and i didn't i didn't know um if uh, you want me i can i'm gonna sh ask him if you if it's fine to upload the movies uh, to the repo and then other people can maybe you know like just, just oh yeah. yeah well uh, online there's lots of movies so yeah. uh, i assume most of them are public today yeah. <laughs> unless they say otherwise <laughs> yes because uh, I saw from the segmentation one, uh, the movies aren't so kind of like just like fluid and right. continuous because they're used for segmentation and, and uh, other purposes. So yes. that's okay. Now, yeah. by, the, by the way, those little dots that you're looking at might be pores in the, in the diatom and they may be acting in some manner as a lens, which makes them bright. Mm, yes. Yes, okay. I think we, we chatted about them last time. Yes. Yeah, which also means they may be angle dependent. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you happen to see them at a different angle, they might fade away. Yeah, I am kind of like aware that the movies that I'm getting, it's kind of like two-dimensional, but the scene itself is probably three, three dimensional. Oh, it is. It's three dimensional. And <laughs> yes, we're kind of losing one dimension like within... But like, what can we do? We're just like we're tracking it, like in the means that we have currently. So. Uh, yeah. Well, what you can do is uh, use a microscope, for example, that uh, tracks the depth of focus, mm -hmm. and uh, then automatically focus that brings the image into focus. Yeah. Uh, there are ways of handling it, but not by image processing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> But the movies that uh, Thomas uh, sent, they are like really good in focus, which is that. Yeah, he probably just picked a segment that was in focus. See, the, the whole colony often, was, well, sometimes, I should like say sometimes, appears to be a spiral, in which case it is three dimensional. Okay. But to see that spiral, you need to back off and see many cells in the field. Keep going. Yeah. Okay. Now, by the way, uh, one experiment I did many years ago is I used a laser to kill cell number two off the end. And to my surprise, what happened was that cell number one went back and forth on the shards of cell number two. Okay, and that, that suggests that the oscillation is intrinsic to the cells. Okay. Suggested that the oscillation is not dependent on being in a column. The cell will go back and forth against the surface even if it's isolated. Yeah. Okay, we did that once. <laughs> <laughs> Around 1970, I think. Oh, interesting. Wow. Okay, <laughs> so it's no old result. Nobody's repeated it, <laughs> and uh, it's, I think it might have been published in an abstract. <laughs> okay, but we the the question was if you look at if you read about synchronization in general, uh, the question is uh, 
is the oscillator triggered by the group or is it intrinsic to the individual? And that experiment suggests that it's the individual cell. Yes. That's the that oscillates. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like I said, like the question is like how how he chooses the frequency to oscillate when it's in a colony. Yes, and how does it adjust the frequency so that the colony has yes. this synchronous? As it's kind of like it's one frequency of oscillation. Okay. So we don't know how the cells communicate with each other to retain this to retain synchronicity. Yes. And that's what that's where the hypothesis of the light pipe came up. That maybe they do it that way. Uh, the uh, the only I wouldn't call it evidence, but the only suggestion for that is if you take single cells that are not colonial and you put them in what's called a wall of light. In other words, if they go, they're in a, they're in a spotlight in the microscope. If they go outside the spotlight, they're in the dark. Mm -hmm. If you do that experiment. The cells go into the dark slightly and then reverse and come back into the light. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's been tracked to something happening at the ends of the cells, which mm -hmm. has a distinct uh, spectral response from photosynthesis. So it's some other, <laughs> you can call it not, I suppose. Yeah, to react to, to light. Which yeah, is to kind of react to the eyes. change in light and reverse direction. Yes. Uh, this is work by uh, uh, by Cohn, Stan Cohn, C O H N. Uh -huh. Okay, if you want, to, if you want to look him up, I'll put his name. In. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that that's been published. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Nobody's ever done that experiment with Bessel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. The only thing I can tell you is one of the questions I had a uh, master's student, uh, Margaret Trapingo, and she showed that if you just turn the lights on and off, if you turn them off, Bessel already stops moving. You turn them on, it starts moving again. And that showed that it's not what's called a diurnal movement. In other words, not once a day, it's just whether, the, whether there's enough light or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's the closest we got. Nice. I think it was before Cohen's work. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for that. That that was good uh, stuff. Good work. And I look forward to seeing some more. I we have more videos, as you know. I don't know. I mean, you know, we could do replicates on it and see if it's uh, stable across the different videos. I don't think the condition there. I think there may be a couple where the conditions are a little bit different, but I don't know. I, uh, I haven't been through those videos in a while. But you have the access to that folder that uh, I think you have access to the folder that I, I think I sent you. Um, no, I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, maybe I'll, I'll check the messages that you send me. I think. Uh, yeah. yeah, maybe it's, it's there. I haven't seen it. But if oh, you, I haven't. yeah, yeah, <laughs> if you can't find it, I have. There is a folder of videos where they're different lengths, and and so they're longer videos. You know, uh, where there are many oscillations. That's actually where you might find the uh, evidence of smoothness or jerkiness because they actually hit the. You know, they hit their limit and they come back and they do this multiple yes. times. So it's not like they do this once. So, you, you know, you have variation maybe across the different oh. oscillations. Okay. Thank you, Susan, for attending. Uh, so that, that would be an interesting thing to do that over like about four minutes. I think the videos are like four minutes. So that okay. would be good. good. Yeah. I'll check them. Uh, right. Yeah. So if I can find them, I'll slack you. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, but... Maybe we should try to get Thomas to do the wall of light for Bacillary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'd be good, actually, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As the colony might act differently, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you could find it. Yeah. So, Karan, hello. 
You see Karan's here. Um, how are you? Could you provide an update on your GSOC activities? Are you having are you, you having problems before your submission date? I just want to know. Uh, yeah. Hi, 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 Bradley. Hi, hi, hi Alan. Hi, hi, Hari Krishna. Hello. Yeah, uh, yeah. Last week, you know, I couldn't attend because my uh, I had this mid sem exam, you know, that was going on. Yeah. So I was expecting to complete most of the things before before I'm, yeah that got delayed. So yeah, uh, as far as the submission goes, I think it's starting. It will start today uh, by eleven thirty p.m., which eight o'clock right now. Yeah. So uh, I was going through the you know work submission guidelines. So they have some you know in, ex, dis, some things that I'm kind of uh, adding on. Okay. The, one of them is you know adding more tests. So I'll be like uh, testing the in inputs. You know if they're in bound or not. So I'll be like creating uh, Python tests right now. Otherwise, yeah, uh, the thing is, uh, the projection part, right, uh, the, what was the way? I'll just show. I think I have an old PPT. Yeah. Uh, this this sort of the version. Uh, this is uh, I'll be you know labeling this as the version one. It's not showing of, that screen. You know, I think it's just uh, showing your other uh, uh, the work that we did for you know improving the 3D model. Uh, is is my screen visible? Yeah, but you uh, don't see the. I think you're trying to share okay. a tab that it's not showing up. Uh, hello, hello. Uh, is my screen visible? Uh, yeah. Yeah. We, we see the um, it's a meetup on your screen. Yeah, yeah. There we go. See the All right. notebook. Oh, no, it went away. <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, I'll be going forward with the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, the model that I described during the initial version, so. I'll be going ahead with this as, you know, the final product because the projection part for the improved model is still, uh, you know, still needs to be refined more. Yeah. Uh, you know, the image stitching part and the model improving. So I'm thinking of... Oh, I lost them. Oh, uh, yeah. oh, I'll let him come back in. <laughs> Looks like it's, uh, yeah, he's got some slides there, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he's got the uh, the early mock-up, and then it's kind of going from there. Let's see what so this He's been working on the projection of the... Yeah, so they're, uh, him and Hare Krishna are building these models. They're 3D models, and then... You know, we have this data set of uh, images that were collected from the outside of the uh, embryo, and they're being stitched onto this 3D volume. And so they're going to be like you know, some sort of uh, atlas, you know, that you can explore. Yeah. And so, yeah. Nice. Okay. I was also like wondering. Uh, maybe later, uh, I don't know if now, but like if we have some work that someone is doing about like the connectome and the uh, kind of connection between the, the neurons to kind of the movement of yeah. the, um, the worm. 
Yeah. Yeah. So we, we do, we have done that in the past. Uh, Open Worm has a lot of stuff on, there are a lot mm. of actually several connectome data sets out there on C. elegans. And, you know, you have the, uh, and then like we've done some work on development, the development of the connectome, uh, sort of the timing of when different cells emerge in, from their uh, developmental precursors and, you know, mm -hmm. the, then, you know, they get connected in development. So we have a couple of papers on that, actually. Um, I can share them with you. Uh, but yeah, we, we've done a lot of, yes. OpenWorm has done like stuff on the adult and then we've done some inferential stuff on development. And then there are other sure. papers on development as well. So we can share that with you at some point. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Kind of like, yeah, it be interesting to take a look. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Karan. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I think I got. I, I think I got disconnected. Yeah, yeah. yeah you did. The network because it's raining. I think the network connection is not that good. Uh, uh, where did I leave? Uh, I, I was talking about tests. I think. Yeah, you had your uh, uh, screen share and you had that first slide with the model. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I'll be dividing it into two versions. The second version still has work to be done. You know, on the projection part. So I'll, uh, you know, write that this, this much has already been done, you know, in the documentation itself, uh, as far as improvements go. And, uh, uh, but since the three goals were there, you know, uh, keeping them in mind, uh, this is there and some tests are there, which are kind of pending. So I am planning on getting them done within a few, within by tomorrow or day after at the max. All right. So the testing part is there, otherwise, yeah, this is the current state of the project right now. All right, so it's-, it's I'll keep you updated. Uh, so is it pretty close to done or, I mean, it just sounds like you just need to do some testing. Yeah, uh, the project with the model is uh, the one that I showed you Yeah. right now. So. That that will be like uh, version one. You know, I'll explain in the documentation how to, you know, uh, convert your images into a three D model using these steps we had done with the earlier mockup. For the second part, uh, I'll mention what all improvements have taken place. You know, in step one and step two. Step one would be you know generating a model using the images, and uh, then till the projection part. You know, just before we project our images after stitching them onto the model. So that part still needs to be refined more. So, okay. you know, things to be done uh, after that. Yeah. But yeah. otherwise, uh, for the submission uh, related purposes, uh, tests are there, like they've, they've given a very broad set of guidelines. So, you know, that they've included a couple of things. So, yeah, so testing was there that, you know, I was kind of, I got not, not thought of before in the thing. But if somebody uses different images, you know, different sizes, or, different uh you know formats and all those things or if they have images which have slightly more uh embryos that have that are slightly more offset from the uh name. i mean there are a lot of ways you know a lot of outliers that could not arrive at the same result so that is there so this testing thing is there that is kind of that will probably do by tomorrow and i'll, I'll update it once that right, otherwise yeah uh for the submission part, I think most of the things are yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, yeah, I just want to make sure we're on track for that. Um, and yeah, please follow the guidelines. And uh, yeah, good luck right. with the last week. Um, and so that that you know, this is kind of like the home stretch, just making sure everything's in place. Um, and uh, yeah, it looks like it's um, you know at some point we'll you know, maybe next week we can do a demo of this, of the completed product to see what it looks like, or, you know, I can set it up so that we can do a demo. I can do the demo on this end too. Uh, so yeah, just let us know. And then the next step after this would be to like see where we are with the projects. So Hare Krishna and Karan are both working mm -hmm. on the same thing, but doing different, doing it in different ways. And so now, you know, if someone wants to use this as a, uh, something you know, something they can use for some data wow. set that they're collecting. Uh, you know, they can actually use it and have a couple of and have some options for what they want to do with it. So I think this is great. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to the final submission.
And again, uh, Hare Krishna wants to meet tomorrow or maybe the next day. So, Karan, if you want to meet as well, uh, I have like... Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. very yeah. yeah, maybe we can do that because I want to make sure everyone, I want to be able to give everyone an opportunity to, fin you know, finalize everything and if I need... Uh, okay. Yeah. So I'll send out an invite for that. Uh, so this was something... Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so there was something in the chat here. Morgan said, I'm going to invite Dimitri to talk about this work. So this is, let's see if I can share my screen here. Um, this is, okay, yeah, guided graph spectral embedding application of the C. elegans connectome. So this is uh, graph spectral analysis. So there's a lot of stuff, of course, we talk about the connectome, we're talking about networks and networks of neurons. And C. elegans is nice because it, it has like 302 neurons. So we know every sort of connection. We know the uh, gap junction connections or the electrical connections. And we have a pretty good handle on the synaptic connections or the chemical connections. The chemical connections have in development, it's really interesting because there's a lot of variation with respect to, you know, which uh, connections are made and which are sort of uh, pruned back in development. So there's a paper um, that uh, it came out like I think two years ago now, or maybe last year, where they did this study of uh, different larval stages of C. elegans, and they looked at the synapses. Uh, the synaptic connections over these different larval stages. And they show there's actually a lot of plasticity in the synaptic connections. So this, you know, this uh, this connectome has actually been pretty well characterized as the whole connectome. So, you know, in human, see in the human brain, it's just kind of an approximation. We usually approximate it from like fMRI data uh, where we can get like coactivation matrices and things like that. But that's not like a neuron by neuron thing. In C. elegans, you have a neuron-by-neuron neuron characterization. And then there's some also for Drosophila and for uh, zebrafish, there are also good connectome data sets there too. This looks like they're doing some things with mathematical pro uh, processing, graph signal processing, which is an area that I've heard of but I'm not really familiar with. And then this is the sort of the way, th this is their work on that for the C. elegans connectome. A lot of times you'll see people use the C. elegans connectome as a benchmark, too, for different problems. So this is where it comes up again and again. Um, there are a couple of different versions of the connectome that are out there on the web. So that's something also that, you know, if you get your hands on a connectome data set, um, you know, it's important to pay attention to how it's collected. Um, usually, the, you know, people have taken images and looked at, like, the gap junctions and marked them and then associate the different cells. So that's usually how they generate it. Um, but this, and this is just kind of analyzing this uh, graph that results from the connectome. And they're doing some things with this graph. They're doing signal processing. So, you know, with the connectome, once we have that, then we can look at behavior because the connectome actually um, map, you know, you can uh, find a circuit, which we usually like in neuroscience because we can map that to a behavior um, in, in insects and in C. elegans and in other organ, like well, Drosophila, I think as well, you actually have some really nice established circuits for like movement and for feeding and for olfaction and things like that. And, you know, you have the cells that are um, active and you just say, well, these cells are connected this way. And, and if you uh, activate them, then they give you this behavior. And so it's very nice. Uh, but, you know, there, we don't really know the entire connectome. It's really kind of difficult to know what, uh, you know, what it's doing, uh, in terms of, uh, what kinds of, uh, for maybe more complex behaviors or other things. So it's a nice, uh, set of techniques. So yeah, Morgan, if you could get that person to give a talk, it'd be great. Cause it's, uh, Definitely a, a area that we talk about. Uh, I think it's one of the areas that we've talked about a lot about graphs and graph embeddings. Um, yeah. And then uh, as for the other 
Our other two GSOC students, uh, mm -hmm. Wataru and Jia Hong. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, they're, I'm going to meet with them tomorrow about their project. They're doing the GNN stuff. And as far as I know, so far, so good. They haven't had any problems. <laughs> so fingers crossed. I hope that, you know, we get our projects in on time. And it looks like we'll, and we're also going to be working on that paper for that learning on graphs conference. But, uh, that's, that's going to be dependent on us getting everything in on time. But I think it'll be fine. Okay, um, so yeah, it's, let's see, um, I'm going to talk about some papers now, and uh, I know that Morgan saw this, and he was excited about it, but there was a bunch of, there's an issue of science this week that focuses on uh, axolotl development, and um, uh, like, I think brain development and some more general development, and so there are just a whole host of papers on this topic now just came out this week in science. So I'm going to share some papers on that. Um, let's see. Oh, we'll talk about that too. But uh, yeah, so I think this is the cover here. Yeah, so this is Distant Mirror, Clues to Mammalian Brain Evolution from Salamander and Lizard Neurons. So they're looking at salamander and lizard neurons, and they're looking at mammalian brain evolution or sort of the... Uh, parallel analogs to it. Um, this is another figure that kind of shows us. This is their advertisement figure. It's sort of the tree of life where you have fishes and you have lizards and amphibians, and then you have uh, mammals denoted by a mouse, but the humans out here. So the tree of life shows that there's an interrelationship between these species, that the brain is, you know, that there's a, uh, a refinement of the of this sort of brain that we all share. Um, and so this is a figure referencing that. Uh, this is a figure from the paper. So they did some interesting work with cell, uh, cell, I cell type identity. And so this is just an, a taste of it where they put this into a uh, identification matrix and they're looking at these different cell types and they're localizing them in the brain. So this is a, uh, some work on that. Let's see if I can pull up some of these papers. So this, actually, this is from Cerebral Organoids. That's not really what I wanted. Um, so this is one here. This is a paper on <clears throat> uh, single ster cell stereoseq reveals induced progenitor cells involved in axolotl brain regeneration. So this is a uh, paper on brain regeneration in axolotl, and they're looking at some progenitor cells. So they're using this technique called stereoseq. And I'm not really familiar with it, but I assume it's some, some sort of uh, microscopy technique coupled with uh, identifying gene expression that identify like different uh, cell types. So uh, we then used high definition large field stereoseq, spatial enhanced resolution omic sequencing. So they're doing this, this is a type of sequencing that uh, allows you to identify cells in their spatial context. You have the uh, expression level of some of the genes in it's an omics approach. So you have a lot of genes that you can look at. And so this is uh, their graph, one of their take home graphs here, where you have the brain from a certain uh, uh, local plane that they're looking at. This is the spatial landscape of the adult axolotl telencephalon. So this is a structure in the axolotl brain. This is uh, where they have the cells here and they have this color coded and these are color coded by the cell type. So they have some markers that tell them about cell type or maybe it's been identified. I'm not really sure what their methods are here. You know, I don't really have the methods up, but uh, this shows uh, the difference between development and regeneration on the right. So if you look at this graph, uh, you have 250 micron resolution here. So that's pretty good resolution for looking at this. In development, you have in stage 57, as they refer to it, you have this sort of structure here, and you have these different cell types, neuroprogenitor, neuroblast, immature neuron, and you can see that there are different uh, areas where these cells are. Um, and then in regeneration, you have these diff other cell types uh, in a similar structure. I think this is 15 days post-injury. 
So you have a reactive neural progenitor, an intermediate progenitor, an immature neuron, and a mature neuron. And it looks like they recapitulate the sort of layering where you have the neural progenitors and you move out towards mature neurons. Right. And in, what, what is that regeneration of? Uh, of the same, I think it's the same structure in the brain, or it's this region of the telencephalon. So or this is cut it out and see if it goes back. Uh, I I guess so. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, they just like oh, yeah, yeah they, they say brain injury. Okay. Yeah, some sort of brain injury. Um, but okay. yeah, the point being is that in development, this area uh, sort of differentiates as it, as it uh, gets put into place. And then in regeneration, I guess they get rid of it or they, they injure it somehow, and it regenerates. And the idea is that it has the same layering from reactive, which is like sort of a neural progenitor type moving out. Did, did anyone do the brain transplant experiment? Uh, I don't think in this paper. I don't know. I mean, there are some other papers coming up. but okay, um, Because uh, many years ago, an Israeli film did uh, an experiment where he trained axolotls to avoid dark. And then he cut a piece of the brain out and transplanted it to a naive axolotl, and they avoided dark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, I've never seen that repeated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this, one, I think this paper they're looking at, uh, yeah, so uh, they wanted, what they were trying they said, basically, if we were to understand the mechanisms of brain regeneration, we need research tools that can achieve large-scale data acquisition and analyses to simultaneously decode complex cellular and molecular responses. It also seemed to us that a comparison between brain regeneration and developmental processes would help to provide new insights into the nature of brain regeneration. Accordingly, we removed a small portion of the lateral pallium region of the axolotl left to encephalon, which is this area here. And I think the convention's flipped, so this is the left side, this is the right side. Um, and then, uh, and collected tissue samples at multiple stages during regeneration. In parallel, we collected tissue samples from the axolotl to encephalon at multiple developmental stages. Mm -hmm. Then we used the stereo seek, <clears throat> and then we looked at this, and this is what the results are. Analysis of cell type annotation, cell spatial organization, gene activity dynamics, and cell state transition were performed. So they didn't do anything with the, with behavior, but they did a lot of this with just showing this uh, structure of the cells in here. Um, and so they have an interactive database if you're interested in, in looking at this further. So that's one paper. Uh, there's another paper here where they did uh, this single cell analysis of axolotl telencephalon organization, neurogenesis, and regeneration. And this is a different group of people. So um, this is really looking at cell diversity in the uh, telencephalon, looking at conservation across species. So you have a comparison with mouse, which is, of course, a mammal uh, analog, and then turtles, which is another type of lizard and amphibian. Uh, and then this homeostatic and regenerative neurogenesis. So this uh, regenerative process, this is uh, you know looking at how this is conserved across these different species and then looking at cell diversity. So they actually did uh, some uh, sort of single nucleus RNA sequencing for this, which is a, a, a different type of, our, uh, of omic sequencing. Uh, and then they also did some spatial transcriptomics. So again, they're looking at the structure. They're looking at this telencephalon structure. They're looking at the spatial distribution of cells in that uh, region. And then they're looking at things during neurogenesis to see what they look like. And so they're able to, this is a little bit different technique, but this gives you, so their conclusions say, our findings indicate that cell types and gene expression patterns associated with mammalian telencephalon regions are also evident in the amphibian brain. So the mammalian and amphibian, you know, uh, uh, synapomorphy exists with this, uh, which means it's a shared derived characteristic. So, in the uh, mammalian brain, you have, or in the in the vertebrate brain, you have these shared mechanisms, and they're derived in different species. But you can see evidence of their shared nature in this in this study. So they look at uh, the way that these telencephalon regions are shaped 
and how they develop and they can see uh, parallels with mammalian telencephalon regions. The evolutionary history of cell types clarified the larger divergence of glutaminergic, glutamatergic compared with GABAergic neurons, which are just different types of neurotransmitters. We observe the axolotl, as was also seen in reptiles. We conclude that in post-embryonic axolotl, telencephalon neurogenesis progresses through diverse neuroblast progenitors, which are associated with specific neuron types and dependent on shared as well as specific regulatory programs. So this is really about uh, you know development and how these things are shared across species. And then regenerated neurons reestablish their previous connections to distant brain regions, suggesting potential functional recovery. So, you know, there's a regenerative capacity in the brain, as we know. In axolotl, there's a high level of regenerative capacity overall. So this is a nice study of brain regeneration. This paper is cell, cell type profiling. And they identify in this paper innovations in a vertebrate for brain evolution. So this is, again, making that connection between the uh, salamander and so this is not, uh, we're no longer in axolotl, we're in salamanders, and we're looking at things that, that teaches us about vertebrate for brain evolution and the connections between the two. So you can see in this uh, uh, graphical abstract that in the salamander forebrain atlas, which they have uh, drawn from, they have these cell types, which are these different types of neural cell. Uh, they're looking at connectivity. And then they're looking at these different innovations versus what we call homology. So homology is like this idea of, uh, well, I talked about synapomorphies earlier. I threw out a term that was from uh, cladistics, but this is the uh, larger category of homology. And homology just simply means things that have a common evolutionary origin that you see in other species. So there are things that are conserved. There are things that are derived and shared or synapomorphic. And so you can see that some of those things exist here. You also have innovations which are unique to a certain lineage. So in mammals, for example, there are things that are innovations there, like neocortex. In reptiles, you have this DVR region. Uh, in amphibians, you have this VP region. And they're all like basically from the same uh, sort of uh, basic tissue type, but they're uh, they change in the course of evolution in different ways. So you have these innovations, you have homology, and that's what they're trying to get at here with this. So they, they I don't think they use any sequencing. For, uh, yeah, they do use sequencing, single cell RNA-seq. So they built a cell type atlas of the salamander telencephalon, which is the thing we've been looking at in the other two papers. And then they're looking at this in terms of what kinds of neurotransmitters they're expressing and they find a greater degree of complexity and diversity than anticipated. And so they're able to do some, uh, you know, they're able to actually then look at the histology and confirm, which is looking at these cells under a microscope with different antibody markers and other types of uh, chemical markers and, and look at, like, confirm what they're finding with the sequencing data. So this is, uh, this is a nice paper. This Next paper is Molecular Diversity and Evolution of Neuron Types in the Amnio Brain. So amniotes are uh, organisms that have uh, like placental births and things like that. So uh, vertebrate evolution took an important turn before the onset of per the Permian 320 million years ago with the transition of early tetrapods from water to land. The appearance of amniotes and soon thereafter their bifurcation into sauropsids. So these are all groups that are like, you know, you have this transition to living on land, this transition from eggs to like live births, and then this, uh, these other groups where you have reptiles and birds and then what would become mammals. And so you have all these different changes in evolution. And uh, despite this branched history, the brains of all tetrapods share the same ancestral architecture defined by brain regions established during embryonic development. So there are these different, these basic set of structures in these brains of all of these amniotes. So the amniotes are a very diverse group of organisms now, but back then they had a common ancestry and they had this basic uh, architecture of a brain. Um, so brain regions, however, do not operate in isolation, 
raising the possibility that the evolution of interconnected neurons might be correlated. And so here they look at this brain atlas. They look at uh, the amniote ancestor here at 320 million years ago. There are, there are mammals, reptiles, and birds that have all descended from this common ancestor. And they're looking at lizards specifically. And they've taken one lizard here. And they're looking at the cell type atlas, which is where you take these different markers. You use uh, dimensionality reduction. You map and you plot it out in this bivariate graph. Um, they've also integrated lizard data and mouse data. So mouses, mice are here in mammals, and they're making that comparison between the two. And then they're looking at this mixture of similar and specific neuron types across brain areas. So they're looking not only at brain areas, but neuron types, and they're trying to make, you're trying to figure out which ones are shared, which ones are different, which ones kind of map to one another. And so um, you can see that there's uh, transcriptome, by, in terms of transcriptomic similarity, there are different neurons that are very highly similar and some that are not. And so you can see the brain's changed quite a bit in terms of shape, but there's still some similarities in different regions. So this is an interesting approach. Um, and then there's this final paper, um, and this is actually really kind of the introduction. This is a mosaic of new and old cell types. So this is something we've talked about in the group quite a bit, um, especially several years ago. Uh, we talked about uh, different types, of, like looking at different cell types in different organisms, especially in development. So this is a picture of an uh, axolotl and uh, transcriptomic, transcriptomic analysis of their brains and those of salamanders and bearded dragons are used to understand how tetrapod neuronal cell types evolved. So this is their model organism. This is uh, what they're looking at here. And this is kind of like the sort of the, the overarching paper for this issue. So this is where they talk about, like basically all these papers are using comparative transcriptomics. They want to know some things about patterns of cell type evolution in the tetrapod brain. Uh, so, you know, they give the list of papers here. Um, so they do different types of transcriptomic studies. Um, they also use whole cell brain atlases, and they're able to get a handle on some of this cell diversity. Um, and uh, so, you know, they use a lot of different new techniques, a lot of spatial transcriptomics. Uh, together, these studies reveal that rather than being a set of old and new regions, Vertebrate brains are formed from a mosaic of conserved and new cell types. So some of the things in our brain are conserved from other from our uh, amniote ancestor, and some of the things are new cell types that have emerged more recently. And so that's you know that's a lesson that we kind of knew about before, but is something that they've kind of really taken pains to show in, the, in these studies. Um, traditionally, brain evolution is studied by identifying homologous brain regions across disparate species on the basis of cytoarchitecture, which is where they look at the uh, different brain maps and they look at like the, how the regions match up to one another. So there's like a cytoarchitecture map. It's basically cell architecture, looking at different regions of different structures and seeing how they change over time. Uh, then they also look at marker gene expression, which are like where if a gene is expressed, you have you can put a marker uh, with that gene. So when it's expressed, you see like a fluorescent marker or something, and that shows you its distribution and its amount. So which, which is something that's you know imperfect. You can't really do that in living specimens, uh, but it's it's informative in terms of this sort of alternative to cyto architecture and then developmental origin. Uh, thus, the brain is often considered a collection of old and new brain regions. The traditional approaches to reg for region comparison do not resolve cell types, however. Uh, but region level conservation might generalize to the cell type level, which is why we want to know more about how to define these different cell types. So the single cell omics methods uh, really can get, a, get to some of these uh, you know, distinctions between cell types. So some of the cell type distinctions are rather subtle. And they have, I, you know, digging into these, if we dig into these papers a little bit more, we might be able to find out a little bit more about how they uh, were able to define different cell types. Um, it One of the things that's come up, it's been a longstanding question, and I know Dick 
uh, can confirm this, but uh, it's really hard to estimate the number of cell types in both the brain, in any one brain or any one body. Uh, if you, you're in C. elegans where the same number of cells are always produced in the same cell types and it's very deterministic, uh, it's easy to do because you don't have a lot of variation. Well, when you get to something like lizards and amphibians or mammals or especially humans, then that number is very, it fluctuates quite a bit and it's very hard to distinguish some of these cell types because you have developmental transformations as we saw in some of the papers. You have, uh, you know, different functional types that are hard to distinguish between. So making that estimate uh, has been very hard. It's been like an order of magnitude or more in terms of making a pro the proper estimate based on like some sample of, you know, a sample of the brain or, you know, just kind of thinking about the different cells in the, in the body. Uh, it's been, it's been a very hard problem. Now, if we have these spatial transcriptomic technologies, can that help us make more accurate uh, predictions about cell type number? Perhaps, but we still have these problems of like, you know, categorization. Uh, you know, if we're including different, uh, you know, what is our criterion? Uh, is it that one gene out of a thousand is, is differentially expressed or is it some sort of morphological difference in the cell? Uh, you know, what, what is our definition of a cell type? So this is the thing that's, it's still kind of a, uh, thing that's up in the air, but, uh, so they're using in Hain et al. They're looking at cell type hypothesis by producing a cell type atlas of the brain of the bearded dragon, which is a species. And this is a lizard. And then they compare the lizard and mouse data. And they find that, of course, cells that from broadly defined regions of both species correspond to each other, indicating conserved regions, which means that those cells don't really uh, change in terms of their identity across species. So that means that, you know, you don't have a lot of generation, at least in that region, of, you know, have a lot of proliferation of different cell types. Um, however, when mapping cell types at higher resolution, the authors observe both similar and very dissimilar cell types across species in almost every brain division investigated. So they looked at these three lobes of the, uh, of the brain, these three regions of the brain uh, developmentally, and they looked and they found that there is actually a lot of diversification in some cases, in indicating the intermingling of both highly conserved and species-specific cell types. So this is a nice lesson for, in terms of thinking about uh, cell types and cell type diversity. And then this final paper, this is a, a preprint from uh, Bioarchive. So should, yeah? So you just, they just say that... Uh... Um, there are like some some structures that are kind of like maybe shared between species. But yeah. When they kind of like mapped it with high resolution, they still did see some diversification on the kind of like shared structural types. That's what you yeah, there's okay. some some of that. Like some in some cases, you'll have like shared structures that are between species, and because you know you think about like the wizard brain and in, in the or well, amphibian brain and the mammalian brain, you have sh structures that are shared, but they look different and they have different yes. functions uh, to some extent. Yeah. And so they're going to have different cell types that are diversified, but you also have things that are conserved that don't change. And so mm. it's, it, you know, it's kind of hard to, to get all that quantified and, and, and uh, but if, yeah. you know, they're making some progress on that. Yeah. Uh, Bradley, uh, yeah. about 23 years ago, I reviewed the literature on the question and the estimates for humans were 256 cells to over 7,000. Yeah. It was a different kind. <laughs> and that's before all these molecular techniques. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we still don't know how many different kinds of cells we have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, like it's some of it is like the, the resolution question, which is like the molecular techniques might help, it might make it worse. Because then you also have the, yeah, the epistemology. Every cell is distinct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the epistemology question, which is what do I want in a cell type? You know, uh, just because you have some molecular change doesn't mean it's a new cell type. It just means that there's a difference in, yeah. I'm going to cat it just a second. So, and then, like, there's, yeah. 
So there's one last thing we're going to be interested in, which is this bioarchives preprint, uh, in interfer inferring and perturbing sulfate regulomes in the human cerebral organoids. So this is the, where they go to organoids, which are these, uh, they grow these in, in uh, culture, and they're basically from neural cells. So they're growing like these analogs of brains or brain structures. And so they're able to grow these from pluripotent stem cells. So they differentiate into these different cell types. And they, but they can look, they're very controlled. They can look at how they form. They can look at uh, different uh, gene regulatory networks and so forth. So this is another way to get at this problem of cell type diversity. You can just basically grow a structure from like stem cells and show that this is, uh, you know, to show how this, this sort of, uh, develops over time and then, you know, get a handle on some of these differentiation processes. Uh, this is one of the same authors as some of the papers or one of the papers that was in the special collection in science. And this paper kind of goes over some of the comparisons between organoids and some of these counterparts in mouse and human brain, which is of course different. Um, but they give, they do the same thing. They look at the transcriptomic profile. They look at like, uh, the different cell types, and they are able to make some connections between those two things. So this is, a, again, this picture of um, the different cell types. So you have telencephalin type cells, uh, neuroprogenitor cells, neuroepithelium, neuroectoderm, and so forth. This is a UMAP uh, analysis where it's like a dimensionality reduction where they get the uh, two components of the UMAP analysis and they plot them. So this tells you something about like how similar they are or how they cluster together. Um, and they do this for, you know, they do this from these organoids instead of from a brain. And so they're able to do this as well. And um, yeah, so actually in, in organoids, you tend to get some patterning. So that's actually good for looking at cell type diversity. Um, you get, but you don't get the entire brain structure. You get like this sort of amalgam of a brain. It's kind of a, it's still a developing area, but it's it's somewhat useful because you can control the process more of neurogenesis. Um, Bradley, yeah. you got a general comment. Okay. They, they missed a, a behavioral aspect, which is kind of interesting. It's been about 90 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And that is the question of polyploid. Uh, axolotls or salamanders. Yeah. But, uh, for those who don't know, polyploid means that they have multiple copies of the DNA in each cell. And this is done by heat shocking the very early embryo. So uh, the, uh, the copies of the uh, genome get made without cell division. And it's, it's been done up to seven ploid. In other words, you can you can then grow an axolotl with seven times as much genetic information per cell. Wow. Okay? Yeah. Now the result of this was curious. The size of the adult animals was the same, which means they had fewer cells. Okay? And the behavioral observation is that they were stupid. <laughs> <laughs> The ones high poly, polyploid axolotls are not as smart as regular ones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we've talked about right. this, yeah. Yeah, and also, you know, because they have fewer cells, it might be easier to do some of this work. Bigger cells, too, obviously. Right. Yeah. yeah, they didn't do anything with behavior here. It was just kind of like looking at the, yeah, Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of interesting because, brain. you know, why do we have different types of cells? Is it for, you know, different types of inputs, different for generating different types of behaviors? It, you know, we don't really know. I mean, we know that like there's certain things that are conserved from our ancestral species. We know that there may be innovations that you have. Or uh, are you know, we over categorizing the cells? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Could be that you have a diversity of certain cell type for different functional purposes. I mean, yeah, we don't know. <laughs> well, cells are small systems. You can't get ident two identical cells, even on daughter cells. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, diversity is should be the null assumption. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they just like all these kind of like, research that they showed is just to show like the types of the cells and not connected to like what the function of the cells like is within an organ. No, no, that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. The well, the structure actually, you know, you can identify a cell type and say this has this, these certain characteristics. The function is a different story, especially in the brain where it's connected together with other cell types and yes. connected into circuits. So, so it's hard to kind of to tell, like, because it's within a circuit, so you have to kind of tell other, right. like, interactions and their kind of... Right, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Hard <laughs> to, you know. yeah. Yeah, try to make a computer that cell reproduces, and each one is different from the other. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but they all still work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, I mean, yeah. you know, we get one, one bit and your computer goes wrong, the cosmic ray, and you're screwed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Morgan, did you have anything to say or any comments? I don't know if he's just listening in, but we have some things in, yeah, in the hey. chat. Hey. <laughs> oh, that is a letter. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the. It's a metamorphosis shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which 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 is actually uh, quite appropriate. Uh, but um, no, I'm joining from a coffee shop and, and see see people I know. <laughs> um, but uh, we're just following along and uh, really looking forward to that uh, that special issue. And um, uh, yeah, I I, I would definitely I love the the PDFs so. Um, since science, I, so I probably don't have access. Yeah. Well, I can share those in the group here. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it looks good. Thank you for that. And yeah, you had some I wasn't comments. sure we were meeting today. It's a holiday. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, yeah, this is... Yeah. Yeah, this well, is... It's a holiday in the, in the U.S., though. No? Yeah, it's a holiday. Yeah, it's a holiday. It's Labor Day. Yeah. Yes. But the coffee shop's are open. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is wrong. Which is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Even they don't labor there, they can be coffee. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, that sounds good. Well, thanks for attending the meeting. Uh, if we have any questions, you can comment. Well, you know, Alon, you know, you can send me some uh, inf more information on Slack if you can't find those data that you're looking for but we have data so right. <laughs> um yeah yes all right thank you guys all right thanks talk to you next week okay. all right okay, bye bye